Welcome to the Apple Insider Podcast. This is your host, Stephen Robles, and today we have an official Apple event happening on March 8th. We're going to talk all about it, give you a big preview, plus some other news. Of course, this episode is sponsored by Trade Coffee. You'll hear about them in a moment. And joining me to preview the massive Apple event coming next week, my friend Wes Hilliard. How's it going, Wes? Uh, pretty good, Stephen. I'm just going to echo William here and say that the Apple car will definitely be announced next week. Uh, <laughs> you know, of all the tea leaves we can try and read in this Apple event invite, and we are going to read all the leaves. I don't know. I didn't see anything related to a car or even close. <laughs> but... The Apple logo beaming out Apple energy like headlights. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, headlight. I, mean, I could see that. I could see that. Well, we're going to totally get into that in a moment. As we've been doing, though, I want to give a shout out to all the five star reviews. And there's been a bunch of them in the last week, which is awesome. Joe from the USA and the cat from Australia. Christopher Erickson. I see him a lot on Twitter. He's from Sweden. Listens to the show. Thanks for that rating. The best panda, but from Great Britain. He must know William, as does Blueprint uh, from Great Britain. I am the Giho. I'm not sure what that means, but he's from Australia. Challenger 46504 from USA. Prairie Dog from USA. Game Man 114 from the USA. C. Sinat. Yeah, I think that was it. So my goodness, so many five-star reviews. Thank you all for that. And we actually reached the top 20 technology shows in the Great Britain Apple podcast listing. So that was pretty cool. We're in the top 20, uh, Wes and William. I don't know if it's all because of William. I mean, I don't know if all the Great Britainites are, are listening for him, but... Well, you know, Britain, it's it's a small place. Uh, they all know each other. So obviously, that's right. <laughs> friends of William's that's right. tuning in. I've been, to, I've been to London once, actually. It's a beautiful city. Oh, I'd love that. to go sometime. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course, uh, on this news, uh, I decided to to uh, run a poll and see exactly how many people are tuning in for the accents <laughs> on the show, for William's lovely uh, British accent or your so-called Southern accent. Yeah, the results were um, kind of wild. Uh, no one on Twitter <laughs> listens to our podcast, apparently. So that, uh, Yes, okay. <laughs> so we, yeah, you did this poll just for fun, which it was a great poll. A uh, so-called Southern accent is not so-called by me, let me just say. I, I have never said this. This is other people saying it. But yes, my Southern accent or William's British accent. But I mean, what was the percentage that said that they that they actually don't listen to the show? It was like over... It is 64% not a listener with a cry emoji. <laughs> right. I had to put that in there. Uh, William's British accent got 27% and your accent got 9%. So I think our podcast is uh, all about William here. I, we even got a comment from someone saying uh, they'd love to see some south ireland representation on the show at some point so yeah we'll have to figure that one out <laughs> yes i did notice that i mean saying it on the podcast is kind of moot because it's the people on twitter that said they didn't listen to the podcast so right, yeah shame on you not listeners that can't hear me talking that right don't now. hear us right now but those of you who do listen thank you because you're the best and so uh, thank you for voting, uh, even though you like William's accent better. I understand. <laughs> a couple things I want to plug before we get to the big event preview. I actually got to interview Chris from the YouTube channel Daily Tech. That was a special episode that aired Monday of this week. He talked about iPad productivity and some of his creative workflow stuff. And we even got into Android versus iPhone stuff because he actually got a Pixel 6 Pro to play around with. So it was a fun interview. I'll link to it in the show notes. And also, at the beginning of that episode was the how fast... Do you listen to podcasts? Chris actually listens at 2x speed when he listens to podcasts. And I was like, who, uh, you know, I was curious how many other people do this. And so we did another poll to see how many people listen at more than one time speed, which some people might not even know. You can listen to podcasts in most apps. Even the Apple Podcast app lets you do this, Overcast. You can listen at like one and a half x, 2x, or even like 1.75x. And so we did that poll right before the Apple event thing went out. And most people, I'm looking at it right now, 67% listen at 1x, but 24%, a quarter of the people that voted, it's got like almost 800 votes now, listen at one and a half speed, which I was pretty surprised. Actually, someone called Matt from Adelaide, Australia, says he listens at 3x speed. And our poll actually included 3x, and it was 4% of the voters listen at 3x. Was, I just, I can't even... Yeah, pure madness absolute madness <laughs> just... i've taken it up like i've gotten a like week behind on podcasts before and said you know what i'm just gonna like sprint and put it on uh 2x with smart speed on overcast and even then it's just like my brain is on fire trying to process information <laughs> flying through you know with everyone saying that i actually did start listening we're going to talk about this a little later but john gruber's talk show he actually had ken cosienda on his uh, latest episode which Ken Cosienda actually worked on the iPhone keyboard before it launched and after it launched. 
But at their interview, it's like two hours and something. And I was trying to listen to most of it before we recorded today. So I was like, let me try one and a half. Oh, no. I did one and a half speed today and it wasn't terrible. Like it was okay. And so I, I don't prefer it, but I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and rock one and a half speed for a bit and see what happens. Most people still listen at 1x, but there's a good number that listen at one and a half and faster. So I usually set mine around uh, 1.5 maybe if I want to go fast, but it's like 1.3 and then smart speed. So sometimes it gets all the way up to 1.5 depending on how many pauses it's eliminating. Right. Yeah, it's just it's just not something I want to do normally. It's, go as fast as possible. It's what I was telling William on Twitter. I could go 1x all the time I would, but I'm trying to listen to more audio than there is time in the day. So sometimes going faster is the only way to go. Right. One last thing before we give a preview of the March 8 Apple event. I did want to mention longtime Apple reporter, like 25 plus years, Jim Dalrymple actually announced that he is retiring from the website that he writes, which is The Loop, where he's been covering Apple for, again, decades. He's retiring from that. He's moving to Austin, Texas, and he will keep doing his podcast, The Dalrymple Report. Probably not very regularly, but he says he still wants to voice his opinions on there. But just kind of a pillar in the Apple journalist community. Loved hearing Jim Dalrymple over the years. Definitely had a great angle when it came to music because he himself is a musician, guitar player, uh, also (laughs) famously a Heineken uh, connoisseur. Yeah, just congrats to Jim and glad to uh, hear he's going to be doing well in retirement. Yeah, I've been following, you know, Dalrymple's uh, reports and stuff, The Loop, for ages now. So, I mean, he's been doing this as long as I've been alive, uh, if that says anything. (laughs) It's just one of those legends in the field, I guess, uh, stepping down. It it reminds me a little bit of Walt Mossberg, who also longtime Apple journalist, reporter, what have you, uh, stepped down a few years ago. And it's just just crazy to me that, A, that was already so many years ago, and B, uh, anytime someone that's been in the industry this long stepping down is just... Just uh, crazy to think about, like, yeah, Dalrymple reporting for my entire lifespan. And now it's just comes to think, you know, when when does someone like who's next? John Gruber, you know, is someone knocking on his door saying, all right, dude, time to time to step away. But, <laughs> well, and that's that's the interesting part is all these guys. I mean, it's totally their purview when to retire, you know, because they're not beholden to any kind of organization. Right. Jim Dalrymple was just doing it by himself. I'm sure John Gruber will be doing it for at least 15 years. You know, now I think he's in his late forties, he said on his last podcast. So maybe less than 15 years. I don't know, but it is interesting to see these kind of pillars in the journalist community starting to retire. It's pretty wild. I mean, Apple's old enough now that, yeah, we, we are seeing people even at the retirement age who's been doing this since the birth of the company. And right. yeah, I could see certain personalities basically doing this in, until their grave. And then, you know, maybe podcasting from the grave. We'll see if the technology exists. Um, <laughs> By then, so. Yeah, hologram. That'll be the VR, yeah, there we uh, go. the meta. All right, well, we got to talk about Apple had an announcement earlier this week. It actually came out Wednesday, which everybody was looking for the announcement Tuesday for the event that's going to happen on March 8th. But as per the last event, the Unleashed event, it was six days before, not seven. And so Apple sent out the invites. I think it was around noon on Wednesday for an event. The Apple event is happening Tuesday, March 8th, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. 6 p.m. in the UK. And the tagline for this event is peak performance, but not like mountain peak. This is P-E-E-K. There was so many people tweeting out when the invites first launched that it was P-E-A-K performance. And I was like, no, <laughs> it's a pun or it's a play on words or something like it's it's peak as in mountain peak. And then the graphic or the image that's also becomes the AR invite is like this almost looking like a virtual reality tunnel of Apple logos, multicolored tunnel of Apple logos. So we can, of course, read the tea leaves, and I think we should. (laughs) We could talk about what we are confident in expecting and then maybe what we hope for or what could be coming at this event. I think, first of all, the updated iPhone SE and iPad Air with the A15 chip, the iPhone SE with 5G cellular data, that's kind of the most expected things. That's what Mark Gurman, who also predicted the event on March 8th, uh, thinks that's going to be launching. So I think those are the for sure things. And outside of that, it's really more powerful Apple Silicon Macs, and we'll get into the details of that. But 
I don't know. Do you feel confident still in the iPhone SE and iPad Air updates? I think that's the most obvious choices, but it's also kind of the weakest choices. Um, Mm -hmm. Like those could be press releases any other day of the week, but there's got to be something there to to compel Apple to do this or even a third thing. Uh, We we discussed this before. I I think Apple can do these events for anything. They could literally walk out on stage and announce a a new Apple TV remote with a new button on the side of it. But I don't think anyone would be very happy with that either. (laughs) You know, Apple can do whatever they want. Yeah. iPhone SE 3 three makes most sense Def- that's like the most absolute definite thing 5g same body we all we've all heard these rumors a million times over it, it's their safe product and uh this it feels like a spring product uh to release and the uh, ipad air we could see 5g in that too there's they do sell those in cellular and center stage a15 processor probably that's it i don't see anything else people are still hoping for things like promotion and stuff in this tablet and i don't think apple's gonna try to steal any more market share than it already does from the 11 inch ipad pro so i think uh i think we're pretty good with a15 there yeah i agree and then when it comes to max obviously performance being in the tagline we're going to be seeing powerful apple silicon in these Macs. the most likely or easy prediction would be m1 pro and m1 max the same chips that are in the laptops come to an updated Mac Mini and an updated iMac. The updated Mac Mini could see a slight design refresh, possibly thinner. You know, a Mac Mini, there's not a ton you could do to make it different. You know, it's a rounded rectangle uh, that's pretty short, you know, an inch and a half, what, tall. So I don't see a major difference there. But I have to imagine that the larger iMac that we've been waiting for, as we're talking about performance, that seems to be like it would be the computer that we're going to see next Tuesday on March 8th. What do you think? Uh, For sure. I mean, think about it. The M1 Pro and M1 Max are only shipping in two Macs right now, the 14-inch and 16-inch MacBook Pros. So Apple has plenty of wiggle room here. They could announce the missing Pro-level Mac Mini and the quote-unquote iMac Pro uh, next week and give us pretty much what fill in those gaps uh, and finish the M1 transition other than the Mac Pro, which again, I think we're all expecting sometime in the summer. So I think that clears it up pretty good because we've heard rumors too of what, that people are expecting uh, the M2 even with maybe a uh, M2 MacBook Air and, and whatnot. And I, I still just firmly believe that's a fall event item. Yeah, I don't think Apple's going to come out with any new processors. This It would be really cool to see a bunch of this be a big flashy event, but I don't know. We just did this in October. It hasn't been that long. And new Apple Silicon is just not on the cards, I don't think. Yeah, I agree. I don't think we're going to see the M2 at this event. It'll be M1 Pro and M1 Max computers. But the wild card is AirPods Pro 2 and or another product category. And I want to talk about AirPods Pro 2 because it was another piece of news this week that Qualcomm, which is a chip manufacturer, you see a lot of them in Android phones and such, But Qualcomm actually developed new chips, the S3 and S5, that will actually enable audio sharing and lossless audio over Bluetooth in products that use these chips. Now, these would not be Apple devices. Apple makes their own chips like the H1 for AirPods and such. But I think it's interesting that Qualcomm has advanced the technology to do something like lossless audio and lower latency over that Bluetooth type connection. And when we've talked about AirPods Pro 2, the conversation has been maybe Apple will do a proprietary wireless connection like using ultra wideband or just update Bluetooth to bring lossless audio to AirPods, which no AirPods model right now has lossless audio or has that low latency. So, Wes, do you think we'll see AirPods Pro 2 at this event? It would be nice because I really need to buy some new ones. (laughs) Yeah, they're dying. Those batteries are not doing well. It's not happy. Sometimes I'll just look at the case and the case is at like 80% and one of the AirPods is at 45 and I'm like, why aren't you charging? Uh, <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. No, Air, Air, yeah, the AirPods Pro 2 would definitely be a nice surprise. This Qualcomm thing, I'm just going to call, you know, bunk. I don't, I didn't read the exact report. If they said Bluetooth, it's nonsense. Uh, Bluetooth lossless. We've already, we've been over this um, just because you slap the moniker lossless on it uh, and then say, yeah, but we tweaked the codec to make it, you know, this or that. We, we know from audio engineers, there's just not enough bandwidth in Bluetooth. It doesn't matter what kind of chip you're using. The Bluetooth spectrum does not cover enough bandwidth to allow lossless audio. So I, I don't I don't believe that. But if they were using some sort of Wi-Fi or other uh, system on that chip to 
allow for lossless audio, then I would believe it a little bit better. But I think this is going to be a marketing game. It's going to be, you know, listen to lossless audio and it's basically lossless minus, you know, just enough to basically saturate that Bluetooth codec with full bandwidth to get as much audio through as you can. But I, I think we're already dealing with such limited capacities in human hearing to hear at that level right. that that small difference isn't going to make a difference. Uh, sure. And if Apple doing this, we've, we've heard them talk about it. And I, I still think AirPlay 3 is the obvious route here. I could see AirPlay 3 coming, it being a Wi-Fi type standard, lossless audio over the air. I don't know if Apple's just going to go in and say, and here's a higher end codec. I think we're going to see more Dolby Atmos like features and maybe they'll bring back the Apple mastered collection or something like that. Mm. You know, I, I just don't see them doing just lossless after doing all of this work. There's got to be something else to it um, because the even the guy who's running this uh, has admitted at Apple that lossless just isn't really a thing humans need here. And um, right. it, the the aficionados who say they can are you know maybe exaggerating, but <laughs> or or just hopeful. But you know, you know how I feel about this. Sure, I th- I think it's time for AirPods Pro two. I feel like that feels like. If they do the iPhone SE, iPad Air, stick the AirPods Pro 2 in there, and then a Mac or two, that feels like an event, you know, because there was a lot of talk about maybe Apple will just do some press releases because of the whole Russia and Ukraine situation. But the fact that they are going ahead with a full event on March 8, which, you know, last year, the first event was April 20th. So, you know, we're dealing with a month and a half earlier than last year. I feel like it's going to have to be a significant event. And AirPods Pro 2 feel like a good, you know, product to launch at something like that. We also don't usually talk about other services and uh, and small tidbits that Apple usually sticks in at like the beginning of an event before any hardware products are announced. And so we could hear about the repair program that Apple announced uh, last year but has not launched just yet, where people will be able to order parts directly from Apple, get those repair guides. That could be something that's mentioned. There could be services, updates, maybe across you know subscriptions or like Fitness Plus, I think about. You know, we could hear about new features coming in a future update. But then again, just to contradict myself, we have WWDC coming up in a few months also. So maybe we won't hear about a lot of software updates. But usually those little things get plugged in here and there. But I do think the AirPods Pro 2, I feel like we'll be seeing those in addition to the Mac Mini and iMac with the M1 Pro and M1 Max. But now for the true tea leaf reading into this invite, So I tweeted and I saw a lot of people saying, you know, to spell peak performance with P-E-E-K, you know, Apple doesn't always do play on words like that. You know, the Unleashed event was very straightforward. It was just Unleashed, you know, obviously talking about powerful chips. That's when we saw the M1 Pro and M1 Max. You know, last spring, it was just the spring loaded, you know, just kind of saying it's a loaded event. We're going to announce a lot of stuff. But peak, to spell it P-E-E-K, it's like, is this the VR goggle announcement. Is this peaking like with your eyes and the logo for the event, which is this Apple symbol that looks like a kind of virtual reality tunnel that you're walking into? Could it be this VR stuff? And then one other point of information before I hear you poo-poo all of this predictions (laughs) is, and you tell me it's going to be September, is Parker Ortolani, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but he previously reported for 9to5Mac. He's now actually at Vox Media he actually discovered that the file for the augmented reality experience with the Apple invite, because with every Apple event now, you can do like this AR experience with your phone, that it's actually using a different format for that AR file than it has previously. And now they're using something called a dot reality, like the extension for this file is dot reality instead of dot USD, which was the previous event file extension for this little augmented reality player thing. And like we talked recently, Reality OS seems to be the leaked operating system that might be coming to Apple's VR or AR projects. So that's reading a lot of tea leaves into a four letter word and the logo that says P-E-E-K for peak. But I don't know, I feel like it's kind of also on the nose. Like it's not reading it, you don't have to read into it too far. I don't know, what do you think Wes? Well, USDZ file format is something Apple introduced uh was available for iOS and iOS 12. More recently, we heard a new thing called 
the reality composer uh do you remember this uh, maybe the reality composer is available on mac it's an apple app you can use your iphone to scan objects and import the scanned objects into it and create basically it's a developer tool for creating ar objects so what apple's done is they've created their uh invite using the reality composer as opposed to a web format so right. that's where the dot reality uh file comes from but still neat the vr headset it's a possibility we're expecting it this year apple's obviously going to go directly head to head with psvr2 this fall which would be very interesting if they do announce this i could see them announcing it early they have nothing to lose in the space uh, by announcing early this is you know so this isn't that printer company right they're not going to cannibalize their own product because right there's no other vr goggles for you to buy from apple so i could see a peak you know that this that the literal meaning of the word uh, that makes sense you know of course the pun of it, it being a site related device but i don't know it, it's interesting I'm, I'm excited i would i would love to see what this is hear apple's pitch on it because i mean it's a vr headset we know what a vr headset is uh we know how these things control what kind of software is available for it. i i expect apple to come out with an apple version of their usual you know this is the best thing ever and you're going to love it but you know how do you do that with something that we've seen for years now i mean yeah. vr has been a thing for a long time now and apple's just now entering the market they have to have a reason they have to they have to explain to us why they're doing this and they will not say the word metaverse so what are they <laughs> what are they doing here right and now i'm trying to think back because a lot of the rumors i think even last year there were rumors that apple will announce like a vr kit or something at wwdc and then that never happened and then the other thought was this year in 2022 well they'll get developers on board before they announce the product but as i think back to it the apple watch was announced in september of 2014 and it launched in April 2015. And so it launched outside of the developer conference and Apple just released those tools to developers at that event uh, to build apps. And so it was actually disconnected from WWDC. Now, if they did that now with a VR headset and also announced new VR tools for developers to peek into what they can make for these goggles, then I could also see them even showing off some things that developers have created at WWDC and then go even more in depth into whatever reality OS that they have in store. If I don't feel super confident about that, but I feel like that could be a reasonable timeline. I can give you some idea, just assumptions. You know, this isn't based on anything except Apple's history and this kind of thing. Yeah. They're just going to come out on stage and say, you know, here's this VR headset. It's targeted towards developers. Uh, it won't be available until probably they'll, they'll, say this this fall or even this winter if they you know want to give them a little bit of elbow room and they'll likely just say keep developing all of your everything you've developed for augmented reality is already uh functioning inside of virtual reality you you mm. you know one button click process you don't have to do anything right uh, and you'll you'll see us demo more of the software at wwdc and the sdks will launch in the summer and you'll be able to start building 3d environments you know for vr they're not going to mention why they're launching this other than you know this is going to be a great tool set for what is obviously the future in so, some computing areas being uh, virtual reality, but also it will help them. They're going to use it as an excuse to map out augmented reality, right. being able to create scenes that you can walk through in augmented reality by ver first testing it in a virtual reality concept. VR is becoming pretty mainstream in a lot of ways. I think I've mentioned this before. I think it's really cool that it's, it's being used in industries everywhere outside. Like this isn't just consumer use. The Lion King was directed using VR headsets. You know, John Favreau would pop a wow. VR headset on and be inside of the 3D animated world of the Lion King and be able to walk around and say, that tree should be over here, that lion doesn't look right, and then walk into a wall because he's wearing a headset. You know, hmm. it's just one of those things. People might be wondering, you know, why would they announce it so early without any kind of product coming in for months, months and months, even maybe even November, December of this year. But you have to remember, Apple is not cannibalizing one of its own product lines already. You know, there's no... I forget the name. Is it Osborne Effect? But Apple will not be cannibalizing its own product line. And by announcing that they have a headset coming, there is a swath of people who might have been tempted or close to buying a Meta Quest VR headset that will not then buy that headset and wait for Apple's. 
And so there is some benefit, even apart from getting developers to start working on it and teasing it and getting people excited, it could very well stop a group of people from purchasing things like the Meta Quest and other VR headsets that might be coming out in the next few months to wait for Apple's. See, that would be strategic. Yeah, and like how you just pictured it, Wes, tease it at this March 8th event, talk more to the developer side of it at WWDC, then the product could launch in November and it's still... Apple gets all the benefits of plugging it early, cannibalizing other companies' VR headset sales, and they get a long on-road for developers to make great stuff for it for it to come out late this year. It's one of those things where it's it's walking a dangerous line. Apple's done this with almost every new product line that they've entered over the last decade. They announce it early, launch it later. Uh, the only yeah. place this has absolutely failed is air power because it just never came to be. <laughs> I don't think the VR headset would do that. Again, this technology is proven. It's real. It exists. It works. This is a Mac component. That it's, it's not going to be a standalone headset. It's not going to be an Oculus. This is going to be a USB-C powered headset. You, it might even have a cable. I don't know. I don't know. Apple could do this wirelessly, but um, this the, just like PSVR. I keep making the comparison because I think they're in the same similar markets. Just as far as a consumer device, PSVR two is going to be a cabled headset, unlike the Quest. You know, so because it's going to be utilizing the power of the connected component. I mean, it would be battery powered, but if this is going to be a development environment and you're wearing a headset and it's only going to last a few hours uh, in that environment, especially it's not only that you're looking at a game uh, being rendered, you're doing the rendering live and editing. It's, it's a multitask, you know, multifaceted product using a lot of power and resources yeah. while you're in it. So I don't see this thing being powered by itself. It could be a dual purpose machine that has both options available, but the headset could be a lot lighter and a lot more versatile by just using the power of the connected MacBook. So I'm just seeing this as it's a developer tool first. If you're really into Apple, maybe they'll pitch it towards consumers as, yeah, and there will be some specialized Apple TV Plus uh, products developed for this. Maybe we'll give you a right. walkthrough of a C set or something. I don't know. Yeah, and that's something when, when Apple announced Apple Silicon, the developer kit was just a Mac Mini with an A12Z. None of the actual M1 branding or M1 computers were announced. And so that could also B, where Apple announces the developer tool, which again, it feels like it would be more of a WWDC thing if they're really selling something, quote unquote, directly to developers. But overall, though, I have to say, I think the final product would have to be wireless. And, you know, there was that rumor recently about the VR headset from Apple be powered by the M1 chip, which seems strange if it comes out late this year. Why wouldn't it be an M2 or some later chip? But if they're announcing it, at least teasing it at this March 8th event, it seems reasonable for them to say, and it's powered by the M1, as they are also announcing all these other M1 branded chips and computers. So I don't know. It's a it's a difficult product to categorize because I don't see Apple becoming a developer of VR interfaces. You know, it's just going to probably run... It. It's going to run this reality OS, sure, but I think it's just going to be a standard interface to launch applications, and then the application is the interface. It's, you know, games or programs, and that, not this other stuff. Maybe a virtual keyboard you get to type on, but I don't know. It's it's just an odd machine for Apple to be releasing, and the elephant in the room is, of course, that this is going to be development kit for the eventual augmented reality glasses that we're going to get to. Um, right, one day. I really hope we see a consumer-focused version version of like on this because if it's pure developmental pure professional type stuff this thing's going to be two thousand dollars and i don't i don't want it to be two thousand dollars <laughs> <laughs> well and you know i think it has to compete with things like the meta quest which is what like 250 dollars i mean it's pretty inexpensive i thought right what is, what is that htc valve or something like that uh vive the viiv oh v vive yeah I, I was confusing it with valve uh the game maker so the meta quest starts at 300 dollars. it's 299 for the 128 gigabytes goes up to 399 for the 256 so i mean when apple eventually does release the consumer facing vr headset it's got to compete i mean it'll be more expensive than this it could start at 499 you know 500 dollars seems like that's what the ipad started at right and it could be the case for this you know a 500 hundred dollar starting point five to eight hundred dollars would make sense to me and i i do want to remind everyone that um a apple has partnered with htc in the past uh on vr headset use with max uh, for development of uh vr platforms or even augmented reality this is all already a thing just yeah. through partnered programs i think apple also has to explain why their 
proprietary hardware would be better for this um, and possibly compete in that space. I believe the HTC headset is in the $800 range, but um, okay, yeah, there's definitely a developer story to be told here. And if, if you're right and in reading into this, uh, the peak part of this, I think, yeah, don't expect any real hardware announcement, maybe even a teaser of what it looks like. I, I think we'll hear this spread out throughout the year rather than getting the full story next week. For sure. This episode is brought to you by Trade Coffee. Listen, when you shop for coffee beans in the grocery store, 90% of those beans are actually stale. Yeah, that's right. The coffee you know and think you love definitely needs an upgrade. Instead of rebuying the same old beans, let Trade Coffee send you something freshly roasted that you're literally guaranteed to love. Trade Coffee sells the freshest roasted and ethically sourced beans from America's best independent roasters. They ship free to you as often as you'd like whole or ground, and whether you're a coffee nerd or just want a better daily cup, Trade's Real Coffee Experts taste test over 400 roasts and use technology to match you to your ideal coffee based on your preferences and brewing method. That was my favorite part of the whole Trade Coffee experience. You take that quiz to get started. They ask you, do you like light, medium, or dark roast usually? And the important question for me, do you do it in cold brew or do you brew it hot? And I brew cold brew coffee in my nitro keg brewer. Plus, Trade Coffee guarantees you'll love your first bag or they'll replace it for free. They've been featured in the New York Times, Wire, GQ, and their subscription is no hassle. You can skip shipments, change your frequency, or cancel anytime. They actually sent me a bag of the Greater Goods Pick Me Up Beans. I use that in my cold brew UK coffee brewer, and it tasted incredible. I love these beans. I keep using the beans from Trade Coffee in my cold brew. You're totally going to love it. And for our listeners right now, Trade Coffee is offering a total of $20 off your first three bags. So when you go to drinktrade.com slash Apple Insider to get started, you take their quiz so they know just what beans to send you at drinktrade.com slash Apple Insider and start your journey to the perfect cup. That's drinktrade.com slash Apple Insider for $20 off your first three bags. Our thanks to Trade Coffee for sponsoring this episode. So the other thing peak (laughs) on this Apple invite could possibly mean (laughs) would be an Apple monitor. Peak with your eyes, P-E-E-K. I don't know. Do you think there's any chance? We have not heard any rumors or leaks about an Apple display really coming soon. You know, we've heard about the Mac mini redesign. We've heard about the larger iMac. I guess there were a couple rumors back in the summertime of different display sizes that Apple might be working on, but it didn't even hit me until we just now really, as we're recording, what do you think? Is there any chance we'll see a monitor at this event? Slim chance. Apple is in the position to make a really cool piece of technology and sell it for a lot of money at a high margin. This is this is perfectly within their field, but they've been in the same position since they stopped selling the last monitor that they had. Uh, it's about the same business as they were with the routers. Like if they, Apple could come out with an airport next week and I would cry. Like it's just <laughs> one of those things. The idea of a monitor at this point would be really cool just because the market right now it's terrible. I don't know if anyone's tried buying a monitor in the last year. It's they're all specced awfully. They all all the companies try to hide what they actually are capable of and use obfuscated uh, spec values like HDR 400. And it's like, yeah, this that's a sounds like a high number, but it's not. And that screen actually is terrible. I know from experience and buying these. Uh, just saying, Apple, just make a monitor that's like your Max like this wonderful MacBook Pro screen that's in front of me and sell it to me for some value, hopefully not as expensive as the MacBook Pro in front of me. Uh, <laughs> so I can actually afford to buy one. Um, maybe, you know, do some really cool stuff with your Apple Silicon and make it pair with an iPad in a really cool way. I don't know. Uh, this this is definitely, Apple likes to operate on the iPad in two-year cycles. And this has been two years. Has it really been two years since the Magic Keyboard and trackpad revolution that they did yeah so we could see and that now it's time for the monitor or i don't know podcasting on the ipad I, there's just so many low-hanging fruits here that it's we would have to do three more shows about it but i agree a monitor is in the cards whether or not that's next week who knows but uh, i'm hopeful yeah and i think if as we were saying a confident prediction would be the mac mini with m1 pro and m1 max an apple display to coincide with that mac mini would make a lot of sense And yeah, we'll have to see. Well, last thing I'll just mention, because this was actually a leak, was the Twitter user Majin Boo 
he actually tweeted this past Sunday about new silicone cases coming for the iPhone at whatever next Apple event. There's a yellow, red, blue, and green colors. So that's also something we'll most likely see at this March 8th event is like little accessories, probably an Apple Watch band, some new releases and some new colors there. Apple usually does that. Maybe even, you know, the last year they did the lavender colored iPhone at the April 20th event. They could actually throw out another color for the iPhone 13 lineup at this event as well. So we'll see. So I do want to tell you, uh, here's here's some um, final off-the-wall predictions for me. Let's get a product red magic keyboard for the iPad. Oh, let's, that'd be cool. Let's do, let's do a new, let's do a black MagSafe battery pack. I don't know. I'm just throwing these oh, out there. Oh, yeah. I like that. Uh, I like that. Yeah. Uh, let's let's get a new MagSafe accessory from Apple. I don't I don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> Any, anything. Maybe it's the Apple car. <laughs> that It's the Apple car is the MagSafe accessory. That is it. You know... They could, I mean, I would love to see, I love the MagSafe Duo. I use it whenever I travel. They could release another MagSafe charging thing. Maybe that does three devices instead of just two, a la air power. Terrible. And here's the shoot for the moon prediction. We're going to get a new HomePod regular guy. Uh, so yeah, just oh, standard listen. HomePod. Okay. So that was the other thing I tweeted out because I think it was your, did you make that image with the, the waves? Yeah, 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 yeah. That was my desk. That's that I took that. Yeah, that was very nice. And you, you had it next to a HomePod. And so the image for the invite, it looked like these sound waves because you had it next to the HomePod. And I just had this fleeting thought, maybe at this March 8 event, we'll get another large HomePod device or some kind of speaker device from Apple. High quality sound, high fidelity. I don't really have any substantial way of saying that that no. is likely, but <laughs> probably not. But I would just love that. So tune in March 8. It's a virtual event. Again, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. UTC. And I'll be doing a recap episode right after the event like I normally do, kind of doing a fire hose of all the information that was announced at the event. So you can look for that special podcast episode Tuesday afternoon. Well, we actually spent a whole lot of time on that event, but I do want to cover a couple other things very quickly with the whole Russia invading Ukraine situation. It's very unfortunate. It's obviously all over the news, but a couple of things that Apple has actually done specifically is that Apple has now made it impossible to buy devices in Russia. So if you are in Russia and you try to buy something on the Apple store, everything is unavailable. They intentionally shut that down. They also removed the RT News and Sputnik News applications from the app stores over there. And they also turned off live incident features in Apple Maps in the Ukraine. So citizens in the Ukraine that are trying to move or maybe even flee from certain things, that those uh, movements would uh, be more hidden, hopefully, that there wouldn't be some kind of reporting of those incidents in Apple Maps. So Apple and Tim Cook specifically has spoken out against what Russia is doing to Ukraine. They are doing those measures to try and help the situation. And a couple other side pieces of news Mac Paw, which is actually based in the Ukraine, they make Clean My Mac X, which is an incredible piece of software for the Mac. They've actually sponsored this show before. Again, Mac Paw is from Ukraine. They're actually giving away a free year of clear VPN that they develop. It is mostly because they want to help people in Ukraine still access the internet. There's been some uh, difficulty with internet access. Russia is trying to block certain like social media networks and all that. And so they're giving everyone a free year of clear VPN. I'll put that information in the show notes. And then there was this other video that was on Twitter of a man in Russia, I guess just some civilian, that once Apple stopped selling products in Russia, he decided to hammer an old iPad on camera and tweet it, saying something like, we don't need your products here. It just seemed very, very strange. Yeah, all this uh, news around Russia and Ukraine, it's just, it's devastating. I mean, yeah. you know, people comment all the time, can we go one year without, you know, a historical event occurring in our life? It's it's just completely tragic. I mean, I, I, I definitely say that I stand with Ukraine and it's difficult to, to digest. I, if, sometimes you just need to step away from Twitter on this, but there's, there are some beams of light, like this crazy man hitting an iPad with a hammer to prove some kind of a point that he spent money on an iPad, then broke it. I, I don't know. It's just one of those things where people feel the need and that, that went very viral, but uh, it doesn't seem to be a lot of that stuff going on, which is a good thing. Um, I, Apple pulling its business like that. I, I know there's certain sanctions that would affect Apple's business already, like uh, selling certain components to uh, government officials. You know, you can't, control that so apple just stopped all sales to right. their products online there's no apple stores so you can't walk into a store in russia and buy an apple product but uh yeah all online sales 
uh, that way have been shut down and likely as a response to the sanctions, but also because their money is virtually worthless right now. Uh, I, I believe we have an article up about uh, how people are selling Apple products for like $10,000 of their money right now because it, that's how much it takes just to buy an iPad uh, in Russia right now. So it's all very crazy to watch and it saddens me to think that as much tragedies going on over there there's still somehow a tech vertical and we have to report on it and it's just ugh, it, it gets so exhausting yeah. yeah i'm sure anyone in this space can agree with that we you know got to do the news that's what we do but it's it's just so awful it is sad you know we try to just report on the tech angle but again just our hearts go out to the people of ukraine and our friends at macpaw again we've worked with them directly and so hope you guys are uh, okay over there and that everything resolves quickly on a lighter note, I did want to mention this video from Quinn Nelson, who runs the YouTube channel Snazzy Labs. He did an incredible mod on a Mac Mini, and I watched the the whole video. It was pretty incredible. You know, he dissected an M1 Mac Mini, which there's actually a lot of unused space in there, and things like the fan is not really necessary, especially when you think of the M1 MacBook Air, doesn't have a fan. The iPad with M1 doesn't have a fan. And so he actually built his own housing for the like just base level components of the M1 Mac Mini. And he made this super cool steampunk looking enclosure. He had the holes that look like the Mac Pro, like the newer cheese grater Mac Pro. And it's just so much smaller than the actual Mac Mini body size. So it's very compact, still has all the ports out of the back, still performs just like a normal M1 Mac Mini. And then he posted all of the schematics and the details for free if you want to try and build one yourself he did like 3d printing on certain parts to make the housing and so i just thought it was super cool it looked really cool and was was like man apple make a super small mac mini that would be really tempting just to have a very very discreet desktop computer that you can then connect to oh i don't know an apple monitor that maybe they could release on march 8th oh right but right. I haven't seen the video. I've seen the progress on Twitter, the images. It's really cool uh, what he's doing. Uh, like, yeah. it definitely makes me wish, and I know this is like a sacrament or whatever, like it's just completely not Apple, but it would be, it, it makes you wonder sometimes, wouldn't it be cool if Apple was a little bit more of a Xiaomi almost and just <laughs> made everything? Like, wouldn't it be fun just to see that random, here's a keyboard with a, with a Mac inside of it that, you know, it's not just a patent, they actually did it, you know, like right. what if we actually saw all the things that they build in their labs and actually release it, you know, instead of them experimenting it, you know with it in a basement somewhere these uh raspberry pi like devices now, imagine if apple made a mac raspberry pi type deal it's oh, you know man. an apple pie you know apple uh, oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> that pun was too good that was that was better than peak performance that's pretty good right like it, it just makes me wonder sometimes if uh apple's missing out i know they you know tim cook it, this has been years now but i remember that interview with that dude in the dark room I, what's his name interviewed everyone on the planet for the last hundred years charlie rose charlie rose yeah yeah i remember tim cook being there and he's like you know this table and gestures at the table we could fit every product we sell on this table and i know apple's really proud of that and that table was pretty uh small at the time could fit everything then not now actually uh, they have expanded but mm. it's just one of those things where they could expand just a little bit more well, let's see something let's just see apple do the weird crazy stuff every now and then i don't know but yes. I, don't, I think the johnny ives spirit in the company would set to flame any time that they tried to do that so <laughs> man Apple pie. I still just can't get over that. That was, that was pretty good. <laughs> oh, so speaking of things that Apple has built, but maybe not released, I do have to recommend two things from John Gruber. One, he had an article called The Origin of the iPhone, where he has tried to pull from various tweets and articles and interviews and put forth a timeline of how the iPhone development occurred. Fascinating article. And the timeline, especially, if you have a chance, take a look. Everything from like the first half of 2005, where Apple realized the Motorola Rocker was going to be a terrible phone. And that is when they decided to go full speed ahead to make a true Apple phone. You know, that was the first half of 2005, just two years before the iPhone is actually announced. And then in summer of 2005, Gruber states that Apple commits uh, to Scott Forstall's idea to make the iPhone software just a stripped down version of Mac OS rather than some other like Linux or other kind of software. And then it just goes on from there. I just think it's a fascinating timeline. And in the same vein of that, Ken Kusienda, who was worked on the WebKit and original Safari team at Apple, 
and then on the software keyboards for the iPhone and iPad. He has an incredible book, Creative Selection. I read it. Uh, it's just wonderful stories about him at Apple working on those things. But he went on the talk show, John Gruber's podcast, and they cover some of that. They talk about WebKit and the origins of that. They talk about the software keyboard on the iPhone. And if you're into that kind of history when it comes to Apple and the technology and the software, I highly recommend. And, you know, Ken Cosienda talks about the kind of devices they were developing on for the software keyboard before the iPhone hardware like even existed. So it's just fascinating. Highly recommend. The podcast is like two and a half hours, so maybe you want to listen to it at one and a half speed. Who knows? If you prefer. Oh, the talk show is always a go-to for me. That's that's an absolute. I'm going to listen to that. that yeah. John Gruber's always a fun, yeah. fun time. Yeah, the, the history of the iPhone, I think, is, is fascinating, too, just because uh, also f- everyone forgets it started out as an iPad, um, which is insane to me that just because Steve Jobs was at some like dinner and overheard a Microsoft executive talk about how cool tablets were. He's like, we got to do this and then gave up halfway through and built an iPhone out of it. That's, that's pretty cool. That's uh, a fun story. And I, I just, I really wish, I know there's a million books out there already. Then everyone's tried to put this story to paper, but I feel like there, there needs to be a definitive, you know, version of this. And if any of you Apple nerds out there are aware of one, maybe I need to go read it, but I'm not aware of a definitive like iPhone, the history. What is this? 2022? It's, no, yeah, not, it's been, yeah, not yet. It's been quite a while, you know, I mean, not long, but at the same time, long enough that maybe somebody could write something, even if it was just a nerd collecting information. Maybe, you know what, John Gruber, I'm giving you homework. Go write a book and uh, let me read it. <laughs> it's actually funny. They talk about writing a book on the podcast and yeah, it's just a fascinating conversation. So I'll put links to both of those in the show notes for sure. As we were recording, Wes just sent me this tweet and I actually saw it. So this is, who was this that tweeted? This is Jane Wong. Just one of those tech personalities that tells stuff. They did share that uh, Twitter is apparently working on a podcast tab. No idea what this means. Does it mean we can record podcasts in there using spaces? Does it mean we can listen to our shows in Twitter? All of it sounds terrible, but I was just wondering your opinion, uh, Stephen. So, you know, Facebook integrated podcasts into the Facebook app, and it's a terrible experience, both as a podcast creator and listener. I did a video recently about what are the worst apps to use to listen to podcasts, and Facebook is without question the worst. I I can't believe Facebook, you can record podcasts on that platform. I want to know anybody that's doing that. Like, there has to be someone doing it. Maybe, but even if you try to just listen to a podcast... If you lock your iPhone screen while that podcast is playing, you have no skip forward or back controls because Facebook uses its own proprietary like media playback. And so you can't even skip forward and back from the lock screen as you're listening to a podcast in the Facebook app. Not to mention just it looks pretty terrible. Very difficult to find podcasts in the app. There's no just like, here's all my you know podcasts that I'm following and I can get new episodes from. It's a terrible experience. But... The one thing I do appreciate is that Facebook auto posts new episodes when you integrate your RSS feed. You can actually listen to it right there in that post. And so as a podcast creator, I know that my podcast page will have a new episode. People can play it, comment on it, and I don't have to think about it. I think Twitter could do a much better job of this if they let me as a podcast creator put my RSS feed attached to my Twitter account or just kind of register it in the Twitter podcasts database. And then my podcast account can tweet out new episodes that you can then listen to right there. We'll just have to see. But I'm I'm very curious about it. I think Twitter will do a better job of it than Facebook. And so I would love to see what they're working on. I, I have high hopes. I'm optimistic about this. I think it would be especially interesting, like I said, if it integrates with the spaces feature, because um, all of that audio just ceases to exist as soon as you as soon as you say it, you're not recording it. So uh, it's just one of those things where if you could bring in multiple voices, almost like a call-in show, like we could just jump on, you know, Apple Insider host, me, you, and uh, William, or even have Jason on and have just a few people in there, raise their hands, ask questions, and just have like a whole thing and have it recorded in some kind of format and post it to Twitter and then download it and post it to the uh, RSS feed for our own show, that kind of stuff. That would be really cool. I could see that functioning very well. I just, you know, wonder what Twitter's business angle is uh, here. And uh, I was going to say, I have one more thing. Did you see the news? about Bandcamp being purchased by Epic Games. I did see that, and that was an interesting acquisition. I don't have many thoughts about it just yet, but... Yeah, just you being in the musical realm of things, I just wondered your opinion on, you know, I, I think that's like one of the final uh, frontiers of 
making your own music, uploading it, and get it, being able to let other people purchase it, uh, just completely ad hoc free from uh, major corporations being involved. That and uh, SoundCloud, I think, are pretty much the only major companies doing that. Yeah, it's curious, and I know like Bandcamp is for those up and coming artist type things, which is again just curious that Epic Games would be the one to buy it, but curious. It's just something to keep an eye on. I think uh, it'll be interesting to see what kind of approach epic takes here are they going to try to compete with the big leagues here and their quote is to basically they want to be the forefront of free and open media of all types music art creation games and uh, so epic wants to be the center of that so they're buying up Bandcamp, i guess as their first acquisition but does this mean that they're going to buy film or other art things could they buy something like deviant art or something you know like and become the next tumblr it, it just it makes me wonder what their end game is here because we've heard them discuss this in the trials with apple their idea of free and open is as long as epic controls it it's free and open and i'm not so sure that's going <laughs> to work out in their favor but anyway all right lastly i just wanted to touch on you actually had a review of the keychron q1 keyboard and I always go back and forth. I have a couple key crons. I have the K2 and the K3. And then I always end up going back to the Magic Keyboard just because I think I like the low travel. I type fast on it. But with the Keychron Q1, I haven't had a chance to try it yet. What were your thoughts on it and your mechanical keyboard thoughts in general? Well, I've had mechanical keyboards for a while now. As long as I've worked at Apple Insider, actually, I've been using mechanical keyboards. That was uh, one of my first purchases when I got the job. And I've pretty much almost always used Keychron, funny enough. Uh, I've reviewed a few other keyboards, but always end up coming coming back to this company. They just make really good keyboards. They're Gator, uh, Gatoron, Gator, I don't know. Uh, I don't yeah. do this on YouTube for a living, so everyone don't... <laughs> <laughs> Don't feel free to cl uh, correct me. It's just, they're really cool keyboards and they're a lot of fun. I like the fact that you can pop the key switches off. I know that's not a novel feature. Uh, everybody can do that now, but you can pop the keycap off, put a new one on. It's a new design and it's a completely different keyboard, but it's the same. Uh, this one takes it a step further and this is what I really like about it. It is just top to bottom customizable. Uh, I called it a playground for mechanical th keyboard enthusiasts for a reason. It's all of the play without any of the work. Uh, if you ever do hmm. look at mechanical keyboards, one of the scariest things is, hey, you, you might have to solder in order to get the right key. Ooh. Yeah. And, no, thank like, you. And we're talking about, what, 85 keys? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you want to replace every key on your keyboard from blue switches to red switches, you're going to be soldering a lot. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. The cool thing about the latest strain of keyboards, again, this isn't unique to Keychron, but they're just doing a really good job with it, is replaceable hot swapping keys so you just pop out the switch so you take out the blue with a pair of tweezers stick in the red hmm. uh, line the pins no soldering required and you now have a new switch and these new these switches they sound different they require different levels of pressure and velocity in order to type so it's all about preferences i personally like the red switches uh, they're quieter, but still clicky, and uh, they don't require a lot of force to actuate. So my fingers don't get tired writing a bunch of words every day. So this thing's really cool, though, because not only replaceable keycaps, replaceable switches, and every single key on the keyboard is fully programmable using software on the Mac. Wow. So you can literally, you know what, QWERTY, throw it out the window, just do your own alphabet if you want to. Don't do that. That's a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> but you can you can literally reprogram every key. You can uh, actually create your own macros. So if you think text expanders and stuff is cool, uh, you can actually go in here and have multiple levels. I think there's two different levels. So if you hold down one of the actuator keys, like uh, one of the command keys or something, and then another key, um, instead of it doing a system function, it'll do a macro function from the keyboard and let you execute uh all kinds of commands or a shortcut or something. So uh, fully programmable, Shoo. replaceable switches. Yeah, it goes as deep as you want it to. It's it's really fancy. And uh, I had I had fun taking photos of my process of painstakingly, because they sent me the exact opposite of what I wanted. I think they did it on purpose. <laughs> they sent me white and gray keycaps with blue switches. So I took every keycap out, every switch out, until it was an empty keyboard and replaced it with red switches with blue and red 
keycaps and uh it was a, it was a lengthy process but one of those things where anyone who's ever built legos before who likes to do these kind of slow but paced thoughtful tasks uh will enjoy this and uh i think mechanical keyboard people will definitely like it well very cool well i'll put a link to west's article in the show notes and if you've never tried a mechanical keyboard it could be fun i mean just the sound you know if you get the right sound it's just fun to listen to yourself type sometimes it makes working uh just a little more enjoyable so i didn't i didn't mention the best part about this keyboard is it is four pounds whoa <laughs> it is heavy uh you that's that is heavy it is not bluetooth you wire it into your your computer it is not meant to move the only time it should come off of your desk is if you're attacking a home intruder <laughs> that's wild very, very nice yeah, it's a, it's 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 kind of crazy. Like when the first time you pick it up, it's like whoa! Like, and there's no reason other than it is thick aluminum and steel casing, uh, which is just really cool machined aluminum uh, around it. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Very cool. I do have one one question for you. Oh are yeah. Are you going to buy? Are you going to buy the Fisher Price uh, toy podcast set? <laughs> <laughs> that did look hilarious. I'll be honest. And uh, if if you don't know what I'm talking about. Wes, uh, he sent me a picture. It, was it a canned SNL skit? Like they didn't air it? Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's one of the canned ones. Did you watch the skit? No, I didn't get a chance to watch it. Okay. Yeah, it's it's not it's not uh, particularly family friend, friendly. The idea is you buy the Fisher Price toy podcast set, so white guys get to say whatever they want, and it's no longer recorded, and they can just yell out into the void. And anyway, just wanted to throw that one out there because we're. <laughs> on a podcast and that was an absolutely hilarious uh skit there's a link i'm sure in the show notes that you guys can check out uh let us know how much you hate me for pointing that out but it's pretty great <laughs> well don't forget tune in march 8th apple event 10 a.m pacific 1 p.m eastern 6 p.m utc recap podcast episode will be coming out that afternoon so be sure to be on the lookout for that and of course thank you for all the five star ratings and reviews in apple podcast that really helps us out you can keep them coming we'll keep giving shout outs and of course, don't forget, you can support the show $5 a month, get an ad-free version, early access, you get into our Discord channel. And so all of that information is in the show notes as well. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.